I took part in the Weston A. Price Conference, which was a real interesting conference um, that took place in Massachusetts for the first time. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Just want to make a few announcements why I'm here. Um, I'm offering this progressive macrobiotic health consultations. If anyone's interested why I'm here, a, a couple of slots are open. I also do acupressure, uh, what I call key energy uh, sessions. It's something that I developed over the years. And over the years I realized that people were doing something related to it called shiatsu, but I found out that the shiatsu that the people were doing was very different. Uh, mine is based on diagnosis. So I found out that in shiatsu and to some extent in Chinese massage called twena, they only have one way of giving the massage, really hard. And that I found out from studying diagnosis, Eastern diagnosis, that that's okay for certain conditions and then really bad for other conditions. So I adjusted it. So my touch and those sessions are very different. I also do um, energy exercises. I teach a, a very high quality level of Qigong exercise for healing. I research many, many types of Qigong over the last 40 years and I came across this one which is very powerful for healing and really works and has tremendous effects. So I teach that why I'm here too. So if you're interested, you could see me after or if you change your mind and wake up in the middle of the night, you can call. We might not answer, but you can call, leave a message, <laughs> and uh, we, we can do that too. Um, I have things here that um, I talked to some people about. I'm doing an exciting program at this Eastover Resort. Uh, oddly enough, about a month or two ago, I was thinking it would be really great to do a more advanced, progressive macrobiotic training program right in my area. And then about a month later, somebody called <laughs> and we, uh, from a contact from where I used to teach, and we set it up. And they're really excited about doing this program. And this is an amazing, beautiful, newly renovated resort retreat. Uh, it's really incredible looking. Um, the Thanksgiving dinner that's advertised here, they're doing in a tavern. They have a tavern uh, and a big hall connected to the tavern where they can get 100, 200 people in. And as an added bonus, my jazz band is playing after Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> uh, couldn't find any musicians, I, uh, and I was very happy to do it. And they have some other musicians doing it during the rest of the uh, week, too. Uh, so we have these programs coming up, and we're going to do an advanced health training program, Thanksgiving training. Um, the Weston Price program is very interesting because Weston Price was a dentist who in the 30s traveled around the world trying to answer the question why people have really poor dental health in his Cleveland clinic, Cleveland, Ohio. And he found out that when he traveled around the world and studied isolated people, there were people who had one cavity out of a thousand in their teeth. It was really amazing. Um, in the first place he went to in Switzerland, they had amazing dental health, uh, no cavities basically, virtually no cavities, and moss on their teeth because they didn't brush. <laughs> so they had moss on their teeth because they didn't brush. And without brushing, they had incredible health and he found that their dental health and physical health were connected. So along the time that I started to really think about how to change modern macrobiotics because of all the problems and people getting ill who are doing this way that this being taught at the major schools, um, after one of my teachers got sick, very ill, um, then I came across many different things that Talk, talk to me about how really people ate macrobiotically around the world. Macrobiotic means longevity. So the way people really ate macrobiotically was they ate grains, they ate vegetables, they ate meats, they ate dairy, they ate fish, they ate all kinds of natural foods, but regularly they ate some animal products that were natural. Sometimes it was dairy, like the Swiss. They would eat mostly dairy products like cheese and then meat once a week. Other cultures would eat fish. Some would eat things that we wouldn't want to eat, insects. Um, and that, that led me to, that's about the time that Sally Fallon founded this Weston Price organization. And so I did a, a class on diagnosis with traditional foods, how to diagnose your organ with traditional foods. And it was very exciting because she felt that this was, she said to me after the lecture that this is the next step for people to adjust the traditional foods that she had been promoting because she had been promoting natural animal foods, vegetable foods, grains, and she wanted people to eat nutrient-dense foods, but now I was presenting a way, how do you adjust those nutrient-dense foods for different health conditions? Uh, not diseases, 
uh, health conditions. That's the basis of diagnosis that I use in counseling, that you don't have the disease are only names. Like if say cancer, that basically talks about, it means crab-like. That's where it comes from, the ancient Greece means crab-like. And if say it's prostate cancer, it's just crab-like cells in your prostate, uh, or around the prostate. It doesn't tell you anything about what causes it, but every condition, uh, there's an underlying condition of every disease. And that's what I um, talk about in consultations. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in the future, in future classes, and especially in the training programs. So this class is called How to Get More Energy. And you saw some pictures that went along with people having lots of energy, uh, jumping around, leaping around. And commonly, one of the things that people complain about is having low energy. There's a kind of like top 10, not the Letterman top 10, though we might do it before he retires uh, from television soon. Uh, but there is a top 10 complaints that many, many people have. And one of the top 10 is low energy. And this is an interesting complaint because Low energy is a complaint both for people who eat all kinds of healthy foods and they try to solve it with healthy foods and then it's a complaint of people who don't eat such healthy foods too. It's a, it's a democratic complaint. <laughs> it's all over the place. People who eat healthy foods, people who don't eat healthy foods and commonly I, I occasionally see people who don't eat healthy foods <laughs> and to come to see me with illnesses, especially in Chicago where a lot of good friends would tell their family members or others uh, to come and see me for their health problem. And uh, so I do see people who eat modern diets, uh, sometimes Eastern European diets too, uh, they're eating, uh, which is a little different than modern diets. Uh, but the Eastern European diets are often farmer diets from the early 20th century. So they run into their own difficulties because we're not farmers anymore. We're not working 10 hours outside, so we have to adjust our diets today, not quite eat as farmers. And, uh, and then I see it in a lot of people, though, who come to see me other places are generally interested in health. That's why they're coming to see me. And they're getting fatigue from their healthy foods, their healthy foods. So in order to understand fatigue, there's a common factor in fatigue among people eating modern diets, the so-called SAD diet, standard American diet, uh, people who eat health food diets, there's a common factor that's missing in all those diets. And it's related to the reason why we eat food. So I put out that question, why do we eat food? <laughs> What's the main reason, what we want to get from food, main thing we want to get from food? <laughs> energy. So we want to get energy, so it's very related to this topic. We want to get energy. So then there's a one, number one thing to give you energy. Can anyone guess what that is in food? Most important thing to have in food. Sugar? Sugar? Protein. Fats, proteins. Well, we, we covered a lot of it, but it's, it's actually something that has gotten a bad rap today. Calories. We need calories. That's the main thing we need to get more energy. And this has gotten a bad rap because if you don't get enough food, enough calories, enough food, your energy goes low. And this is especially true, and we'll talk about some of the other energy zappers, if you're putting out a lot of physical and mental energy and you're not taking in energy, it's even worse. It's even worse. So the, uh, and the institutions have it all wrong too. I have one of my CDs here is on weight loss. Surprising myths and truths about weight loss. And I'll give you away one of the myths. It's not calories in and calories out. That's not makes weight loss. It's not a simple equation like calories in, calories out. It's not that calories don't count. It's just it's not that simple. Just reduce your calories and exercise more and you're going to lose weight. It doesn't work. They've actually proven it doesn't work long term. Works short term, but doesn't work. So uh, anyone who's interested in the weight issue, that's a really good CD because it's based on the newest research, newest scientific research uh, about weight and uh, myths about obesity. Uh, people are less obese than people think <laughs> uh, in America. And the main one related to calories is that for women, uh, the authorities, be careful of the authorities, they say, 
the authorities basically uh, tell you that women, if they want to lose weight, should eat 1,200 calories for weight, and that and they can be healthy and lose weight with 1,200 calories. Authorities also tell men that they can lose weight on 1,500 calories and stay healthy. Yeah, they lose weight and stay healthy. Now, both of those are starvation diets. You cannot lose weight on them for the most part. You can, but it's anorexia. It's weight loss through an eating disorder. And it's known the longer you have an eating disorder, every year you have an eating disorder, you start to reduce your lifespan. And an eating disorder is 1,200 calories for women, 1,500 calories for men. That's an eating disorder because that's, that's, too, that's a starvation diet. Now, why I'm saying that is because here's, a, here's some evidence of that. And if you like to read it, it's a real interesting read. Not, an, not that interesting for people. It's about this thick. And it's a book, textbook that was written called The Biology of Starvation by Ansel Keys, part one, part two. I got them to stem through it, but I just didn't have enough time to read through it. You know. <laughs> just, some of it got really interesting. Part two is really interesting. But what they did, they did something called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment in the end of the war, World War II. You're not allowed to do that anymore. But they put men on 1,600 calorie diets, young men in their 20s on 1,600 calorie diets for 24 weeks, and they saw what happened to them. What happened to them at the end is they all looked like they had been in concentration camps. Um, they were all and they all through went through physical, mental changes, incredible physical and mental changes of degeneration. Their metabolic rate uh, dropped 40% uh, during that time. And they, they were testing them through exercise and they hardly could do anything compared to what they did before. So they had mental and physical degeneration from that. That's 1,600 calories for those men and 1,500 calories is what the authorities the dieting authorities. Now, most of the dieting committees, do you know who makes up the dieting committees? Can you guess? People who work in dieting centers. <laughs> so, so they have a vested interest in dieting. So calories, you know, calorie, lower calories, we need calories. So how much calories do we need to get enough calories? Well, studies of healthy men and women who maintain their weight, they find that before 25, you know, as a teenager, not as a little girl, but as a teenager, before 25, women need 3,000 calories. Teenage women need 3,000 calories. Teenage men need 3,500 calories. You think women are getting anywhere near that? Not today. Right? Men are not, many men are not getting near that either. But that's what they need to rebuild the body, have enough energy. After 25, uh, women need 2,500 calories and then you take a little bit of calories off for every year. So if you're 60, you might take 2,300 calories. Except if you're overweight. Interesting thing. If you're overweight, you actually need more calories to lose weight. Because your fat cells won't burn without weight, without enough calories. And men need 3,000 calories. And again, you take a little bit off. Like you're, you're a few years past 20, 25, like me. <laughs> then I would get down to 2,800 calories. Right? So, as a general. Now, I'm not saying this because people have to count calories. The only thing is that if you're eating, many people who come to see me are eating healthy diets and they have low calories. So let me tell you how people get an energy deficiency from low calories on a healthy diet. They start out their morning with a kale smoothie. Kale smoothie has basically no calories and it has the thyroid wrecker, not the home wrecker, uh, kale in it, raw kale. If you want to wreck your thyroid, eat raw kale in a smoothie. Uh, just in case anybody wants to wreck their thyroid. <laughs> I don't think you, if you, a thyroid is a good thing not to wreck. <laughs> so you want to have a good thyroid. But, but anyway, it wrecks your thyroid because of coitrogens. But a kale smoothie has no calories. If you put fruit in there and it's a little powder of protein or something, no, no calories, really. No calories in that. Now if you put yogurt in it, whole milk yogurt, maybe more calories. But but no calories otherwise in the normal kale smoothies. Or someone will skip breakfast. You know, very commonly people will skip breakfast who are eating healthy because they don't feel good eating breakfast. So they don't feel good because by the time they've slept, you know, since the last meal, not eating enough, their digestive system doesn't have enough energy to eat the food in the morning. 
to digest the food. So that's why they skip. So someone will have a piece of toast or they'll have a piece of fruit or they'll have a cup of coffee. And uh, even, even you know, healthy eaters will have, of course, they might have green tea instead. <laughs> uh, or, uh, or chai latte or something, you know, with, with soy milk, of course, right? So, so, which also wrecks the thyroid. But again, not much food in the morning. And then when I ask people when they're eating food, they'll say, like this happened the other day, I, I was someone who's really physically active, train, is a trainer. She would get up earlier in the morning and i say, well, how much, what do you eat in the morning? I said, I have a half cup of oatmeal. Now, just, just in case you didn't know, uh, a cup of cooked brown rice that's, dr that's cooked, not watery, is 150 calories. Right? Even if you ate three cups of brown rice a day and you didn't eat other f rich foods, enough calories, you're not going to get enough calories for your body to function. You're going to be tired from that. So, okay, then what is that many health food eaters eat? People who are healthy or think they're healthy or want to be healthy, uh, what do they have for lunch? What's well, very common, the most popular one? Salad. Salad. No calories. No calories and indigestible. So often that leads to bloating later in the day because human beings can't digest a lot of raw foods because we don't have a rumen. Remember the rumens? No. Uh, rumen is a stomach that has bacteria. And basically, we don't have it. The ape has a big one. Eats five hours a day, raw leaves. Elephant has a big one. Cow has four of them, four rumens. So I'll, I'll bet you four rumens to your, no. Uh, but anyway, four rumens, basically they can eat grass, right? So they can eat grass. They can digest grass because they have four rumens. The rumen is the bacteria. It ferments the fiber and breaks it down. So we eat this. Not only do we not ca have calories, but later on someone might have bloating and not wondering why because they're eating healthy. You know, they had their... You know, they had their, you know, they had their fruit in the morning and they had their salad at lunch and so-called. Everybody thinks that's healthy, but no calories. Or some people will have a soup. Soup is very low calories too, because mostly water. Maybe a piece of bread. One piece of bread, very low calories. Again, so, so then there's two things that happen in the afternoon. You know, people might, when people have a snack who are health conscious, and I happen to see a lot of them, uh, their snack is usually as small as can be. So why is it as small as it can be? Like, you know, a little half an apple or a few pieces of grapes or a uh, granola bar. Why is it as small as it can be? Because people think that it's really good to eat less calories. So they have a tiny, tiny little snack. But by the afternoon, there's some interesting things that happen. Either they have another healthy snack that's very tiny, not enough calories, or they binge. Because after running all day on no energy, who are you going to call? <laughs> Not Ghostbusters, but sugar busters, right? <laughs> so you're going to go to something sugary because your brain is crashing and it wants energy. So then you might go to, you know, if you're working in an office and after starving yourself all day, they bring the chocolate chip cookies around, that nice, you know, nice friend who brings the cookies or the cupcakes that you made at home. And then you look at it and you think, okay, well, I'll just have one. <laughs> and after going back four times or five times, your one exploded into many. Right? So, but it's a given because basically you not, don't have any energy. So at night, people will have a, a good meal, but there's also a misunderstanding. People think that if they eat carbs at night, what will happen? Do you have any idea what they think, what people think out there? What will happen if they eat carbs at night? They'll gain weight. There's actually no relation to carbs and weight gain. It's not, there's no relation. That's a myth. There's really no relation to carbs and weight gain unless you've been starving yourself. If you've been starving yourself and you start to eat, you gain weight first because the body wants to rebuild itself. So then there's a relation that way. But there's no, there's no relation like carbs because how do we know there's no relation between carbs, even refined carbs, and weight? Who can we look at around the world to see that they're pretty skinny eating lots of carbs? People in the Far East, <laughs> you know, eating lots of rice, lots of noodles, real thin. <laughs> you know, they don't have a lot of obesity. So carbs is not really related to weight gain. That's a myth. And it's a myth that's being promoted by lots of paleo folks today and other folks. And commonly, you know, even it goes back a long time, starch puts on weight. And there's a few big authors who have written some interesting books, but they're wrong about the carbs. 
because the body needs carbs for energy. Without, en without, that's the main energy source. We can't run on fat. I know, I tried. <laughs> I was experimenting. I tried to eat a lot of fat and lower the carbs, and I always noticed why I was always sluggish. You know, after a while, it felt great, but then I got sluggish the more fat I ate. So I had, fat is really healthy food, but I just reduced the fat, introduced more carbs. Hey, energy came back. Great. <laughs> interesting, interesting experiment, right? But I knew but firsthand. And uh, so when people eat a lot of fats, they get more sluggish not, and at the expense of carbs. You can eat a good amount of fats and eat your carbs and be fine, too. So, so we need calories so, uh, at the meals. Now, let's go to the modern eaters and how they do it. <laughs> let's see how modern eaters do their low-calorie diets. Well, what do they do? They eat irregularly. A lot of people eat irregularly. So they'll like skip breakfast, then eat lunch at 2 o'clock, then maybe eat dinner at 10. Or they'll have breakfast and they'll have lunch at 4. And maybe they think, you know, it's too late to eat, so they skip dinner. This is very, very common. And then on top of that, people have erroneous ideas of dieting. Um, dieting is not a good way to lose weight. But that's the big myth. I explain this in more detail. Dieting is a way to ruin your health. Eating the right food eventually can make you lose weight if you need to lose weight. Uh, but you can't control completely your weight loss. A lot of people think they can control their weight loss. They can't really completely control it. Uh, when you're young, you can do anything and, and lose weight and do things because you do stressful things to your body. But as you get older, your body will go to a certain set point. Now, you could reset the set point. Um, but the myth is that by starving yourself, you're going to lose weight. What happens by starving yourself is you train your body to hold on to weight. Uh, because if you could manage, there are people who manage to stay on real thin diets, uh, real low calorie diets, and you notice that they're very calm and mild mannered. Have you noticed that? No. no. <laughs> I've always noticed the people who stay on those diets, e either they're born like saints or they are, get real irritable and tense and controlling because there's a brain chemical imbalance. If you can manage to stay on those 1500 calorie diets, yeah, some people will starve and lose weight. But what happens is the rest of their body will crash. They'll have all kinds of other health problems, physical, mental problems, and they won't relate it to their diet because they think they're eating healthy because we've made a mistake in America. We've equated, equated thinness with health. Thinness with health. Thinness and health don't necessarily go together. Um, in fact, as people get older, having a little bit of extra weight is protective. Um, yeah, having, even in great obesity, if someone's 400 pounds, dieting w can eventually starve them and lose weight, but a better way would actually be giving them ample foods, uh, good quality foods, and having them eat regularly and exercise and mildly and moderately to get their body functioning uh, better. So, so calories are important. Uh, the number one for energy. And so basically what I recommend, uh, people consider taking, if you're having low energy and if you want to see it related to calories, compute how many calories do you eat on a regular day. Remember, like, things like brown rice have very low calories. So if you eat a cup of brown rice at a meal, that's 150 calories. T times three, say if you ate it three times a day, whole grains, other whole grains are similar you basically get you know, something like 450 calories. If your diet's really low fat, you're not getting many calories. People vegetarian and vegan have to work at getting more calories because animal foods like dairy and meat, natural meats and other foods have some fats in them. So basically vegetables have virtually no calories. Uh, they don't have many. Beans are kind of like grains, you know, so they have similar amount as grains, maybe a little less because there's less carbohydrates in there. Uh, so you could see that your calorie count can be quite low. So if that is your, if you think, after you compute for a while, I don't recommend, you only recommend computing calories to eat enough. <laughs> so I, I'm, 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 a, I'm the opposite of what other people are saying. <laughs> Instead of counting your calories to make sure you're not eating too much, uh, basically I recommend you count your calories temporarily to make sure you're eating enough. Get an idea of what is enough. And for some people, if they, there are some schools of thought that 
when people are really low on calories, they have to take some refined calories. An athlete must eat refined sugar uh, and flour to get enough calories because they need like 6,000, 7,000 calories, and they do it. The bicyclers, they'll, you know, they'll like to eat huge amounts of calories because they're burning so many calories. So uh, now you could do it with natural sweets too, but you know, people will need, some people will need to emphasize and have things like maple syrup and organic molasses and honey to up their calories and dried fruits and white rice, organic, I usually recommend, without talcum. They put talcum on the other ones. So organic white rice, organic white noodles, uh, sourdough bread that's both white and whole wheat uh, so that you up your calories. Some people even have to judiciously use things like ice cream or some juices that have more calories just to get the calories up. And natural fats, the best fats for calorie, raising calories is saturated fats. Someone who wants to be vegan vegetarian, that would be coconut oil and palm oil. Uh, if someone wants to, doesn't mind having butter, you can have butter and coconut. But those fats will also raise your calories. The only thing about fats is always keep carbs one, number one. Corn grits, steel cut oats, those are good morning calorie rich foods. Tortillas are nice calorie rich foods. So you could see, you know, uh, so see if that's your, if you, if you have an energy drain or someone does, the first thing to look at is calories. Because what happens is when you lower your calories, you have signs of low metabolism. And uh, wonders of technology, you know, just read you some of the signs of low metabolism. So low metabolism, these are signs of a, a, adrenal fatigue. And the adrenal fatigue are the same symptoms as anorexia and starvation. That includes fatigue, insomnia, sleep disturbances, poor digestion, constipation, poor immunity, frequent colds, flu infections, low blood pressure, sensitivity to cold, muscle weakness, and poor recovery from exercise, anxiety and depression, irritability, poor memory and brain fog, and loss of appetite, um, cravings, fixation on food, um, and loss of period and reproductive dysfunction. So these are signs of low metabolism, and one of the main lowers, lowers of the metabolism that causes energy loss is basically low calorie eating, low calorie dieting. Now, that's not the only thing. So that's the main energy sapper and the main energy creator, eating enough calories, um, good quality calories, so there. So when also calories can be gotten from natural meats, natural dairy products, but I recommend the hormone-free meats, natural meats or poultry or fish, wild fish or natural dairy products, not the commercial ones. So sometimes people misunderstand. They think, oh, I mean, go to McDonald's? Um, only, uh, only if uh, <laughs> you don't care about your health, <laughs> go to McDonald's because they have the worst grades of meat mystery stuff in their food, chemicals, additives, all kinds of things. So uh, McDonald's is only a cure for someone who has an eating disorder and they have to really eat a lot and their, their ap appetite is so low uh, because nobody does calories better than McDonald's. <laughs> I don't recommend you use them for calories, but nobody does calories better. <laughs> so, you know, a, a big gulp and a cheeseburger and french fries, hey, calories are up. So in some cases there are I remember there was a case in, when I was living in a, a macrobiotic community in Boston where they were teaching like a more simple, narrow macrobiotics with the philosophy of balance. Um, there was a man who lost his appetite, stopped eating. And they were giving him all kinds of natural things when he really needed McDonald's or pizza or ice cream. He just needed something calorie rich that would kickstart his system. But they didn't give him because the people who were helping him had too much of a concept of natural, only natural. There's a time for unnatural foods <laughs> when, when to shock a person or get someone out of a really stuck state of low calories. Because what happens is you get a brain chemical imbalance, you lose your appetite. That's what anorexia means. It means no appetite. So basically the first, first thing is the uh, you know, calories and to counter the low metabolism. Now, low metabolism will also be created by other factors that we have to consider.
For instance, one of the major things that lowers the metabolism among, among natural eaters and saps your energy when your metabolism goes down is polyunsaturated fats. So the polyunsaturated fats are things like corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, almond butter, peanut butter, almond milk, hemp milk, hemp seeds. These are all the polyunsaturated fats. So polyunsaturated fats are more soft and liquid at room temperature and they cause your metabolism to go down and cause an energy drain and this is why animals that go into hibernation eat these a lot. Squirrels and bears eat a lot of these polyunsaturated fats and then this slows their metabolism down and they hibernate through the winter. But unfortunately it can slow our metabolism down so um, I learned first from Sally Fallon when she wrote her article, The Oiling of America, that saturated fat consumption in the last century went down. But polyunsaturated fat consumption went up a thousand percent in the last century. It's in everything. And it's also in commercial chicken. Because when you feed the commercial chicken lots of grains, it gets a lot of polyunsaturated fat in its skin and tissues. So when people eat a lot of commercial chickens, which now people are doing because they think it's better than meat. So they're eating a lot of chicken, commercial chicken. And then you go to restaurants and you get anything with dressings. Uh, you think you're getting Italian dressing with olive oil. It's usually soy oil, another polyunsaturated fat. Um, there's a famous brand that was created by an actor who is now passed. I won't mention any names, but I think you might recognize who it is. <laughs> uh, it includes the, the letter P. <laughs> and uh, basically, I was surprised when you get the Italian dressing, the first ingredient is soy oil, polyunsaturated fat. So it's in all the foods. If you go to the supermarket and you look at all the cakes, there's no butter in the cakes in the supermarket. It's soy oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, polyunsaturated. Now, there is some evidence that this accumulates in the body and can make you tired. So what happens is that if you don't eat enough, this fatty acid comes into your tissue and makes you more tired, make, comes into your bloodstream. You break it down as an energy source, but it's not a great energy source. There's also some evidence that eating saturated fats helps to block the effect and discharge slowly the polyunsaturated fats. So eating things like coconut oil more and butter more, you know, usually that an average amount might be, depending on your size, two or three tablespoons a day. Some people can eat more if they're bigger or you need more energy, uh, some people less, and it might vary, you know, how you do it, but it, most people need about two tablespoons of one of those fats a day. Uh, and this will help to get rid of these polyunsaturated fats. Now, here's another one that's very popular and, and it has a double whammy that slows your metabolism and makes you tired. Watery foods and drinking a lot of water. Speaking of which, I'm kind of dry from being in plain to plains today. And airports. <laughs> so, watery foods. If you over drink, you wash out sodium from your body. How do you know you're washing out sodium? If you wash out sodium, it knocks down your adrenal glands. When your adrenal glands go down, your whole energy of the body goes down. So how do you know? Here's a, here's a, if you're not taking, if you're taking a multivitamin, or if you're not taking a multivitamin, it's easy. But if you're taking a multivitamin, you stop the multivitamin for three days. And after three days, you see what color your urine is. If your urine is really pale, like clear, you're either drinking too much, taking too much watery food, or you're not taking enough salt in your diet. Salt is really very important, not at all related to blood pressure, that's been disproven, but salt is really important in the diet to keep your adrenals strong. It's not that you have to become a salt lick, or an honorary one, you don't have to use that much salt, but you should salt to taste, because that will help, especially if you're tired. If you have signs of adrenal weakness, which is swelling under the eyes, purple under the eyes, bags under the eyes, then definitely salt the taste. 
And uh, if you have problems with water retention when you salt, then it means your metabolism is pretty low. So you want to go lower on the salt until you get your metabolism up, calories, you know, fats, and carbs, get them up. Now, uh, so basically, watery food, like eating lots of salads, eating a lot of raw fruit, that slows your metabolism. In fact, if you have a high metabolism, you can eat more watery foods. And you might be able to guess when your metabolism goes up naturally in the year, when it's hot. <laughs> so, but there are people who don't get that hot in the summer, uh, but some people do even though their metabolism is low. Now, here's, here's one quick way to test your metabolism. It's, uh, you test your temperature. Uh, you could test under the armpit or you can test orally. Uh, in the morning, you test, wait five minutes before you wake up and take your temperature under your armpit. Uh, maybe if you take your temperature under your armpit, you want to take your temperature under the armpit all day. <laughs> you don't want to go back and forth between your mouth and your armpit, uh, unless it's super clean. Uh, but you might test it and if it's n it, it should be a little bit lower, but if it's lower than 98, you have a low metabolism. If people will also test their, their te temperature during the day, and it should be 98.6. If it's not 98.6, you have low metabolism. Um, you should can also test it after you eat. And if you test it after you eat, something may be slowing your metabolism. Like, for instance, you ate a big salad, you test under the armpit, you know, half hour after, and it goes lower. Uh, you know, you eat some... Uh, you know, fried white, wa organic white rice with vegetables and some salmon and, uh, you know, and some cooked vegetables. You find it goes up. You know, you can adjust your diet uh, by how you see. So that's a good way to tell. So a lot of watery foods, of course, uh, I'm co continually telling people to stop their smoothies in the morning. Um, I might be, I have to rename myself the Stop Smoothie King <laughs> because I tell everybody to stop their smoothies whenever they come to see me. And because they're very proud of their smoothies, so I have to be careful, you know, because they're very proud that they're doing something really healthy like a smoothie. And so then I, I say, well, I think you better not do that now. <laughs> so very gentle with how I say it because they're really proud of their smoothies. And I explain why. It just lowers the metabolism, crashes the metabolism, not enough calories in the day. Uh, you need calories uh, to get up. So these are kinds of things that drop the metabolism. Now, the other thing that drops the metabolism, if you don't eat enough fat, metabolism drops. Huge amounts of fat, metabolism drops. So you need a certain amount of fat in your diet from mostly saturated, then mono next, like olive oil. And then also, if you eat too much protein, metabolism drops. So 24-ounce steaks, metabolism drops. Don't en have enough protein, metabolism drops. Now, the amount of protein concentrated, concentrated protein only comes from animal foods. If someone wants to be vegan, I usually recommend protein drinks, some protein drinks to make up for that because there is protein in grains and there is protein in vegetables, there's protein in fruits, there's protein in all those foods, but I think that protein is best as a complementary protein. It does raise your protein levels, but people need concentrated protein too. And most people will do better if they have some kind of concentrated protein at least once a day, you know, from fish or natural meat or chicken or some natural dairy. Some people do better twice a day. Some people do better three times a day as a pattern for them. Some people do better three times a day for a while when they're really protein deficient. One of the things I discovered is whatever you're deficient in, you need a lot of. Deficient in calories, eat to your heart's content. Uh, until you rebalance. Then after a while, you don't need as much. You just need what you need, what I talked about before. You're deficient in fat, go crazy on the fat. So that's what I did. I remember I was deficient in fat because I was eating very low fat, you know, modern, almost vegan macrobiotic diets uh, for a long time. And so when I, I couldn't get enough of that fat, and I did an experiment because I was very conservative. So I'd eat fat and I said, oh, this is harmful. It's too many fat to cut it back. It didn't feel as good. Put it back in. Ah, I feel good. They said, no, no, my mind got in the way and said, oh, it's not good for me because uh, fat is evil. It's evil. <laughs> you know, and then, uh, then I put back in and it felt good. Then I started eating lots of fat and felt fantastic until lots of fat didn't feel so fantastic. You know? But I kept doing it anyway because then I had a concept, fat is good. <laughs> not fat is bad. I went the opposite. 
But still, I, but I, I never went back to really low fat because I don't feel good. So I you know, eat a few tablespoons a day at least of something. And, uh, and sometimes more if I need it. Uh, because what we really want to get is to the intuitive understanding of what feeds your energy. We don't want, to want an ideal of what feels your energy you know, from someone else. And that's where I think modern macrobiotic teachings made a huge mistake. The huge mistake is they were teaching fasting starvation diets, which can work for some people for a period of time. When they get off high amounts of meat and sugar, and people can heal even. But staying on a fasting diet becomes then a starvation diet. And then so many people got sick, several people died. Two friends, more friends just died early, young, in their 60s, doing this for 40 years, the narrow eating for 40 years. So, uh, the, I, but you can't get, the problem with modern macrobiotics teachings is that you can't get to intuition of food if you cut out foods. So you're not going to know that you need good quality dairy unless you know what good quality dairy feels like. You're not going to know if you need, you know, a grass-fed steak, not, not a bad quality one, until you experience, well, this is what it is. The only catch to that is when you're off something a long time, you get ill when you eat it first because <laughs> your body has to get used to it. So you get ill. You have a question there? Another way of testing uh, a pH strip, a non pH strip for acid versus alkaline. You the, Some foods the, make too much acid. The question is that can you, uh, testing your acid alkaline with a strip, you can't. You cannot test. That's a myth. Uh, that's, a, that's a wrong idea in science because when you test the acid alkaline strip the, uh, here uh, on your mouth, you're only telling your saliva, not your blood. Mm -hmm. You don't tell the effect of food. But that actually does tell you if you have enough minerals in your body, if it's alkaline. Your urine should be acidic. It's made with uric acid, so it should be acidic. That can't, people would try to get it alkaline. Acid alkaline was started by raw food vegans okay. who wanted people to stop everything, <laughs> meat, dairy, and things like that. There's no science behind it. You cannot, and you, basically acid and alkaline is something that your body does, not the food. That's the myth. You're not going to alkalize by eating lots of green smoothies. In fact, you'll probably become acidic. Even though it's alkaline, you become acidic because your metabolism crashes. The organs don't function. High glycemic versus low glycemic foods. High glycemic and low glycemic is another myth. Yeah. It doesn't exist. Um, those things, that, that's basically started by, the, that was actually created by people in the dieting industry. Um, it has no effect on the body, high glycemic, low glycemic. It doesn't have an effect. The only thing that has, because basically high fructose corn syrup, is low glycemic, <laughs> but high, high gly But basically, if you give a little bit of sh sugar to someone, they can't, in a few weeks, it doesn't create diabetes. If you give a huge amount of high fructose corn syrup, beyond what you could ever get in diet, like a thousand calories a day of high fructose corn syrup, you could never get that by eating fruit. Then, after two weeks, they start to have signs of diabetes, people will take that. But that's not in a natural, but some of the people, People out in the public today, researchers and others have theorized that that's all natural sweeteners. Like that's fruit, that's honey. But people have been eating honey and fruit for thousands of years, no diabetes. In fact, when they people put people on a whole fruit diet, I don't recommend it, but they put people on a whole fruit diet for months, all the blood markers become better, <laughs> including... It doesn't apply. It doesn't apply. The high blood sugar is, is complicated. They don't have, a, it's not related to sugar. It's not related to sugary foods. It's related to metabolism. What happens when the metabolism goes low, some people's blood sugar start going really high. And so the key is to get the metabolism up. So it's no fasting, eating adequate calories, no polyunsaturated fats, and some of the other zappers, we're going to finish up with the other energy zappers. Um, besides, you know, eating enough food, eating enough pr adequate protein, adequate fat, enough calories, good carbohydrates, both refined and unrefined, natural ones. Uh, some fruit is actually helpful for people with diabetes. It actually is helpful to do that, to, not to be low, low glycemic. Fruit juice doesn't seem to be as helpful uh, to help people with their blood sugar, but you need an adequate diet 
to balance your system so that basically they, they found a, an interesting link and if you like to read about this go to a website by Ray Peat raypeat.com, P-E-A-T. There's a link between estrogen and diabetes. And estrogen, we call the female hormone, but men have as much, produce it too. And it's produced when your body's under stress. So he has some interesting articles that give insights. So stress is another factor that knocks down your energy, but we'll talk about it a couple of different ways. You know, talk about stress, how it affects you in a couple of different ways. The main stressor is usually diet. <laughs> because we don't eat enough or we eat too much of other foods. If you eat a really high refined sugar diet, your metabolism will drop too. Because what happens is then you make a nutritional deficiency. People on the, if you are, your diet is very nutritionally deficient, like people eating modern diets, like with high amounts of sugar, refined flour, no vegetables, sometimes not much meats or other foods, then basically, or, or a lot of alcohol, drugs, you basically become energy deficient. So if it's a nutritional deficiency that's causing the stress, then people have to look into things like B vitamins, consider supplementing with B vitamins, uh, vegetarian, vegans, and narrow macrobiotic eaters, they have to look at B12. B12 is definitely uh, something that causes energy deficiency and you can't get it in the complex. You can't get it in the multi, you have to take it separately under the tongue. It's very hard to test for it too. Uh, some people are de deficient in vitamin C who have been under a lot of stress, so they have to take some C supplements to build up their system. Um, there are signs, and I do this, it's kind of complicated to explain, but there's a sign in the eyes that show you have a chronic infection. It's yellow patches of yellow coating of mucus in the eyes. It shows that you have chronic infections. If chronic infections is the problem, that will lower your metabolism, sap your energy. So, Eating healthy foods and enough will boost your immune system, but some people will need some immune boosting supplements like things like zinc or selenium. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, you know, that would be the immune boosting supplements. If you could just wait a second for some questions and um, I'm just gonna finish up so we can open to questions. So if you could hold the questions or just remember them if, if you can. Um, so basically the, you know, but stress, going back to stress, when people, for instance, don't sleep enough, the body goes into stress mode. A lack of street sleep is a sign of low metabolism. Low metabolism puts you in the stress mode because it turns out you actually need energy to fall asleep. If you don't have energy, you can't fall asleep. That's why people are exhausted, they can't fall asleep. So it goes back to getting enough energy from your food so that you can sleep and enough nutrition from your food so you can sleep. Um, so, but if you don't sleep because of lifestyle factors like you're going to bed at 12.30 or 1.30 and getting up at 6, 7, you're not going to have energy because you're going to be running in a stress mode. Now, as I mentioned this running in a stress mode, there was a man, Hans Sale, who studied stress and he saw various signs of stress. The first sign is your body gets really revved up. That's when like a thin woman will lift up a car to save their child. You know, they get the strength to lift up a car, um, but tomorrow they wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, but if you're under continuous stress, then what happens is all the systems start to shut down, slow down energy. And eventually, if they shut down enough, you know what happens. As the system shut down more and more and more, so the final shutdown is death. So, but, or you, but, it, but, the, third side, but the third stage, sec, first stage is high energy, second stage, slow down. This is the stress stages. Slow down the organs. Third, slow them so much that they malfunction and then fourth stage, so, so little energy that the whole system stops. You know, that's when death occurs. So stress is not generally something you don't want to be in because of this. Now, people will have physical stresses, like people will exercise too much. Exercise is a stress, and they'll exhaust themselves, and they'll lose up their energy, and they won't recover. And a uh, couple, last few months, I've always been interested in all kinds of exercise, so. And I've always been fond of body weight exercises, but I never knew anybody. I found some people who told me how to do it progressively, like advanced calisthenics. These are calisthenics you do with body weight to strengthen the body, not for endurance, it's not doing 50 push-ups, it's doing 10 hard ones, <laughs> and then 10 harder ones, and then over time. And I had an interesting experiment with I wanted to push further 
And then I would really be achy and tired for days. And then I said, oh, okay, I did too much. And then I would do the next week's set of that, and I would do a little bit less, but enough to push myself to the next level, and then I'd still feel a little achy, but good. <laughs> so uh, I found out that, you know, what, what was the balance for me? Some people over-exercise, and then they don't recover, and that makes them worse. On the other hand, under exercise itself is very healthy because we're, ba we're made to exercise some. So finding out exercises that you'll do consistently in love is also a de-stressor and it makes you feel great and, and is helpful for you. So uh, another energy sapper is the cold. Coming into the cold here now, right? So <laughs> not yet. We're, we're hoping this Indian summer will last a long time. But the, uh, the cold will sap your energy and the heat will give you energy. So that's why it's really important to keep your metabolism high with eating certain high energy foods like enough carbs, enough fats, and some natural sugars and sweeteners in the winter. That's why people in really cold climates go for a refined sugar, alcohol, but it, has, but it ruins their health. So you can't rely on alcohol as a de-stressor because it ruins your health. It's just too toxic to the body. So, so stress, finding out what are the causes of stress in your lifestyle can also help you to get more energy finding out the causes of stress. There's some de-stressing exercises. There's qigong and yoga breathing, gentle yoga, not hot yoga. Hot yoga is stressing. So when they, hot yoga is where you exercise in a room that's 100 degrees. <laughs> that's stressing. But gentle yoga is de-stressing. Qigong exercises are de-stressing. Meditation and breathing are de-stressing. If you do them consistently, they really de-stress the body. And then, before we open to questions, I'll, I'll leave you with one, one more aspect of stress, something. Um, last 40 years, more than 40 years, I've always been interested in meditation type of practices. In fact, it was uh, yoga and meditation that led me to learn about modern macrobiotics and start to study about that uh, because I was always interested in the mind and spirit, you know, the mind and spirit and how it worked. Uh, because I had some interesting experiences when I was young with that, you know, with connecting to something that was different uh, around us. So then I was always interested in, in practicing meditative type practices. Uh, for me, Qigong is meditation in motion. And when I was studying yoga, and, and still when I practice yoga, I find it a kind of meditation too. But it's meditation without motion, <laughs> just stillness in a posture. Uh, I've also practiced various kinds of meditation practices with sound and with the mind. And when I came across a few months ago something uh, that explained why the meditation is beneficial. And this is something called the three principles. I highly recommend it to help you de-stress your mind. The three principles are, it was discovered by, uh, it was something that was uncovered. He said it was actually uncovered by, a, uh, by this Scottish welder. And uh, the funny story was that he had some conversation with a psychologist and the psychologist said to him, you're not, don't lack confidence, you just think you do. And somehow this man, Sidney Banks, in his mind, these, he got this insight, just came to him that basically, oh, our feelings are our thoughts. We're making them all up. And he came up with these three principles about mind, thought, and consciousness. You know, mind, thought, and consciousness. And, and part of that understanding is that thought is the creative impulse of life, but thought creates feeling. Even if it seems to be instantaneous, thought creates feeling. If you understand these three principles of mind, consciousness, awareness, you understand that if thought creates feeling, then you could create a th you're creating your reality. You're creating your... Yes, there's circumstances. Most of us think that reality is coming from the outside. They call this an inside-out philosophy. And it's very akin to Eastern teachings that say similar things. Is that, but it, it, it's explained in a contemporary way. And so Sidney Banks, who didn't have more than a ninth grade education, went on to teach psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors, addiction counselors. He traveled the world the rest of his life teaching people about this. And the, the thing about it that's interesting, that I find, it's a contemporary way of explaining things like the yoga teachings and the meditation teachings for modern people. Um, 
similar to, and I could have an affinity to that because I think what I'm doing with this uh, modern macrobiotic understanding is making it for modern people and connecting it not just to one culture, say Japan, but connecting it to all cultures. And we have to, we have to take the essence, we can take the essence of the teachings of the past, but it is the past and it was from a different time and a different people. We have to make it for today. Uh, but they still have some wonderful essence we can take. And Sydney came up with this without ever studying any Eastern teachings. Uh, but it's a very interesting. There's a book, if you want to, there's so many books that are good, but one book that says it really simply is written, this is very big in England and Scotland and Ireland. And it's, the book is called Do Nothing by, uh, by Damien Mark Smythe. That's Smith with a Y, Damien Mark Smythe. So this is a way to understand that the interesting thing about these three principles is that he came into this insight that there's two types of mind. One is the universal mind, doesn't change. People call that God or spirit that we're connected to. And then there is the individual mind that's always changing, <laughs> the personal mind. That's oh, it's never staying still. It's always changing. And then the principle of thought is the creative impulse of life. That's how we create our life, through thought. And then awareness is our, our ability to see forms. The forms were created by thought. So the ability to see forms, forms created by thought. So, so he, you know, in this book, you'll hear him say, he'll challenge anybody to think of anything that doesn't have these three involved with the human. Um, and it comes, to, it's reflecting on this and getting more into it helps you realize that we have a choice, although it takes time because we have habitual action in our mind. For instance, when we have stress, we have habits of mind that deal with certain stresses that are that are basically easy to go down because we're so used to doing them. But eventually we could realize, when we realize that we make up our reaction and that it's not set and it's not the external circumstances, eventually we could break those habits and this has incredible de-stressing effect. Now, on a personal note, it's interesting because it explains something that I've been able to do myself and I never understood why. <laughs> um, that, you know, that something would happen and I'd get upset and then I would just stop thinking about it and my, go back to my default mechanism which was being more calm. And, and I didn't realize why it was easy for me to do that and other people I thought it wasn't so, it was harder to do. And I, I think it actually is because of all these meditation practices because in the meditation practices you end up watching your thoughts and, and seeing them pass through and just let them pass through. So I think that training made it easy for me to watch my thought unless it passed through. Not to say that I'm perfect in always letting them pass through completely. <laughs> no, right? Either that, I'd, you know, I'd be St. John. No, right? So <laughs> I'm not St. John. So uh, it, I, sometimes I do attach to them, but I let them pass through easier and now much easier because I understand. So this can help you as a de-stressor too. And stress in the mind uses up an incredible amount of energy. Uh, for people. You know, they really get sapped, especially if they act on their low thoughts. So um, there's an expression that another writer of these three principles say is, when your, thoughts, when your thoughts are low, leading to low moods, then be graceful. <laughs> don't act on them that much. Don't, don't take them serious. Don't act on them. But when your thoughts are high, like, and you feel great, be grateful. <laughs> <laughs> so be, be careful when your uh, thoughts are low, you know, not to take them so seriously and make big decisions in that time. And then when they're high, grateful. Uh, the default mechanism is high thoughts, by the way. But the interesting thing is when I read this, I always relate it, maybe just because I've, you know, if you studied nails enough, the whole world looks like nails. You know, <laughs> but I always relate it to health too, because if you keep your health well, then it's much easier for your mind to function that way. Your mind can still do that without being healthy, but it just helps you when you're healthy, your metabolism is high. So the main thing I'm saying is high metabolism, high energy. Uh, yes, nutrients, but sometimes people need extra nutrients, but that's not the key. The key is really high metabolism from food, lifestyle, you know, sleep, uh, stopping and smelling the roses, rest, you know, that's really the key. So I uh, want to open up to some questions before we finish up. Uh, one over here, one over there, uh, one over here. Me. Does Azuki tea give you energy? Does Azuki tea give you energy? And the simple 
Simple answer would be no. Uh, Zuki bean is not for giving energy, it's for helping, helping the kidneys reduce swelling in the body. So it won't give energy because it's very, the only thing that gives energy is carbs. Sugar, carbs, fat. That gives energy. Those are the foods that give energy. So anything that has that, so like for instance, mochi will give energy because it's concentrated carbs. So it gives energy. Um, you know, and uh, noodles will give energy. Yeah, that will do that too. A good meal will give energy. Question here. So you mentioned that um, for men, let's say 300, 3,000, 3,500 calories is like a normal. So most of the people, um, like spend the day in the office, not a lot of activities. That's without activity. Yeah. So if, uh, for example, someone eats the calories with that kind of activities and then gain the weight, does it mean that uh, he, he doesn't have good uh, digestion system? Or, or well, the thing about that is, well, 3,500 calories would be someone who is under 25 for a man. Right, no, right. so we're talking about 3,000. 3,000 calories if you're 60, maybe 28. Right. You know, you're 50, maybe 29. But if you, what happens is everybody gains weight when they starve themselves. When they don't eat enough, it's natural to gain extra weight. That's what happened in the starvation experiment. And people who are now rebuilding themselves after going on natural starvation diets, they all gain weight, and sorry to say, they gain weight around a place that nobody wants to gain weight, around the middle. That's natural. But it's best not to limit your calories. It, it, if you gained weight on that, it, it could mean that you starved before. Now you're not starving. So your body rebuilds itself. It goes through a rebuilding process where you rebuild tissues and you gain weight. Uh, it could indicate that basically your metabolism is, is low, and that means you have to you know, do things to de-stress um, you might have to, you know, if someone went through a period of rebuilding themselves by eating adequate food and they still gain weight, then they could add in like some progressive weight exercises, either body weight a few times a week or, you know, physical weights a few times a week. That helps weight loss. And if they were eating healthy and enough calories and they still had weight, then they could add in a little more exercise. But only after a period of recovery from not eating enough. Once you've recovered from not eating enough, then you could also experiment with having a lighter dinner, you know, just to have less calories, but, but only until your metabolism, but your metabolism has to be high. For instance, if you eat a lighter dinner and you check your armpit or temperature, uh, body temperature, oral temperature before you sleep and it's crashing, then you can't eat a lighter dinner. It's not good for you. So that ar armpit, or even you could take the temperature here, it can be a good way to monitor when you have enough or not. So uh, for those kind of situations, they're pretty individual. So I usually recommend a consultation so I could look you know, closely and see what the issue is, if there was an issue. Okay, any other questions? I have yeah. marvelous disease. Um, do you recommend a particular diet? Well, the, the autoimmune diseases, there, there is some evidence that autoimmune diseases is low metabolism diseases. So that basically, you know, you, uh, you need to raise your metabolism. And, you know, when you talk about diseases like that, then it's pretty, there's sometimes people have to work on the kidneys, some people have to add some things for digestion, some people have to work on, do things for intestines, some people have to get infections down, special things, some inflammation. So, uh, only I could say about that, the metabolism is the key, but in that kind of case, I'd have to see someone for a consultation to really zero in to see what the issue was. Does it make a difference if you have uh, a high-calorie pasteurized versus unpasteurized Well, you know, when you can get, well, it depends on the food. Like, for instance, milk, well, milk, unpasteurized milk, I generally don't recommend for most, pe most people. Uh, pasteurized milk. Unpasteurized, I would admit. But that may not be, you know, if it's tolerated, that can be a good source of calories, but that would be raw milk. In Illinois, you have to get it from farms. Uh, pasteurized milk for everybody is not that digestible. Some people can digest the pasteurized milk from good grass-fed animals. Um, they're known as Jersey cows, the older animals. And if you can find that in the store, uh, then some people can digest. If you can digest it, then it's a fine source of calories too, as long as you don't waterlog yourself with it because uh, then it lowers the metabolism. Yes. What about the probiotics? Do you, do you probiotics is basically 
the best probiotics are miso and pickles, but sometimes people need other ones. I recommend one uh, called body biotics, which is unusual soil-based bacteria, which can really help to reestablish the intestinal bacteria. So if you're interested in that one, you can uh, you know, just contact us through the email and can tell you about it, how to get, get that. Uh, I don't think I have some with me this time. I sometimes travel with it, but I think we're out. Uh, we just sold it out. Um, other probiotics can be good, but the other probiotics, uh, the, both the body biotics and body biotics is different. It's a soil-based bacteria. And the idea behind that is that when we're all, all growing our own food, then we tended to get some soil in our food and that went into our intestines. And it was complementary to our own bacteria. So body biotics is un unusual that after you take a lot of it for six months, you reduce it just to take a little bit to help the b benefit, like a capsule or two a day. Like you, after a couple weeks, you might build up to six and then you reduce to one or two. The other probiotics that they sell in the health food stores are good for someone who is really on antibiotics or someone who has really bad intestines. But the key really to making those intestines function well and getting good bacteria is raising your metabolism, making sure you're raising it. So basically, you know, there are a lot of people who are on the narrow macrobiotic diets who don't get enough calories because they're limiting their fat, they're eating only whole foods and they're limiting their sugars and they're not eating any other animal foods. The diet becomes extremely low in calories and everybody's metabolism crashes on that. Now, the only people who don't uh, are younger people who have really strong adrenals. So if a young person, the sign of the strong adrenals in oriental medicine is your ears go down from here to your mouth. So if you have those really long ears and you're 20-something, uh, then you could go on real narrow diets and your stress hormones will run for many years uh, until you reach the age of immortality. You know that age? It's 30. <laughs> after 30, you think you're invincible. But after that, you wake up after all nighter and it's like, oh, what happened? <laughs> yes? So, what happens if you don't have enough calories and you do a lot of activities and you're, what are you burning? What's happening to you? Well, you start to burn up bone and muscle. You start to use that for energy. And then you also start to, uh, then it also knocks down your metabolism, knocks down your body function slowly. But depending on the person, it takes a while. <laughs> it takes a while to do that. A person who's very active, say like a teenager is very active, they, you know, a young woman will need more than 3,000 calories if they're doing a lot of sports and things. So that's why you know, they're, uh, for a young person also, you know, some refined foods and some non-refined foods are fine. So you know, white pasta is good, some good quality pizza, a good quality ice cream. There's some bad ingredients in regular ice cream. I mean, once in a while, it's not going to hurt someone if they're healthy. But, but good quality ice cream has less fillers and stabilizers and What's stuff good in there. Ice cream? Well, in the health food store, they have a couple of brands, a um, couple of brands that are in the health food made with organic milk, and some of them, like even up near us, it's grass-fed milk, <laughs> grass-fed animals. So, uh, but they have some, like I think there's, I always forget the names of the brands that tells you how much I have it. You know, I don't eat a lot of it, but I, I, I have, you know, had some because, you know, a healthy person can use that sometimes as medicine too. Uh, but, you know, but, but the, other medis the other ones are poor quality. Um, you know, some hormone free is like Ben and Jerry's is hormone free, but if you look at their flavors, they put a lot of odd ingredients in their flavors. The only one that's hormone free that's plain is like vanilla. All the other ones have, they have actually, some of theirs have high fructose corn syrup in it. What about rice dream? Rice dream I don't recommend. A rice dream is worthless. No nutrition at all. So it gives you sugar. If someone, for instance, if someone was absolutely wanted to be vegetarian vegan and wouldn't eat the dairy, then rice dream might be okay, you know, as a solution. Because at least you're getting the natural sugars. But you're not getting any other nutrients there. They're only sugar. The only sugar is the nutrient because the, in organic milk, you'll get other nutrients. So if a young, for a young person, much better. For instance, if someone wanted to be vegan, I usually help them with supplements and balancing their diet. If someone wants to be vegetarian, I think it's easier to balance, keep your metabolism up by eating natural dairy and eggs. Uh, someone wants to eat other foods sometimes, then it's easy, even easier. But it can be done. It just depends on the person. Any other question? Yes, uh, almond milk, organic almond milk comes with versus uh, 
non-GMO organic soy milk? Um, organic almond milk or organic soy milk like versus skin. them. It's not a versus because neither are good for you. Soy milk will wreck your thyroid if you use it regularly and uh, wreck your metabolism it's, it, through the thyroid. It has very high amounts of goitrogen. So almond milk is too high in polyunsaturated fats. Yeah, something if you had once in a while, but if you want something regular, either organic milk from grass-fed cows that are pasteurized, organic raw milk, it's much more nutritious, or coconut milk. Coconut milk is better than the, all those milks to have regularly. I mean, I'm not saying, it depends on the person. Like if your metabolism is really low, when counseling people where metabolism is really low, I really have them stay off all the polyunsaturated fats as much as they can, except if they have such low calories, then I'll let go of that for a while just to get the calories up. But after a while, if their metabolism is still low, I'll cut that back because those fats store in the body. And if I think they're stored, the only way to really get rid of them is really minimize them. And for a healthy person, you know, having some, a little bit of nuts, a little bit of seeds is fine. Um, if you have good energy, you know, we're talking about good energy, occasional almond milk. Uh, soy milk I don't think has any value, just only because I don't think it tastes very good uh, uh, compared to other milks. To me, I've, I've never really enjoyed it. Um, and it's not really a traditional food, but, it's just, uh, but it does, can really hurt your health if you take it regularly. And one more question about smoothies. Mm -hmm. So if um, I use, uh, let's say, kale and bok choy and dandelion, and if I blanch it first. You never want to put them in a smoothie. Why? Because the, you don't get rid of the goitrogens when you cook them. It only minimizes them. I recommend everybody minimize their greens. Don't eat a lot of greens. No more than once a day okay. or less. Because, so but I wouldn't put them in a smoothie. The smoothie has no benefit for your health at all. Zero benefit. What are you getting from the smoothie, do you think? You're not, the greens, concentrated greens, are not beneficial. Let's talk about ingredients. I add right. coconut oil. Right. Right. I add flax seeds and right. chia seeds. Okay, I that'll lower your metabolism. So flax right. and chia. Yeah. But it lowers the metabolism tremendously. So, not healthy to have a lot of omega-3. And if you have that for breakfast, yeah, I don't know if you're having it for breakfast. Do you have it for breakfast? For breakfast or yeah. for Okay, if, if, you, if you have it for breakfast or dinner, that's really bad for your health because it lowers your metabolism. Zero calories, almost zero calories. No calories there. You need at least, let's just put it another way. You know, if you're going to average your calorie consumption at a meal, every meal, uh, you need, you know, young, a woman needs 800 calories each meal, or maybe a little less at a, another meal and more at another. You need 800 calories. So the smoothie, you're getting like 100 calories. And you do that in the night, if you have tr you're going to have trouble sleeping at night. People who do that will have trouble sleeping. You may not, but people can have trouble sleeping. Um, they can feel bad the next morning. There, it's really a terrible practice, that's what I'm saying. It's not a good practice to, ha to have a meal substitute. That's what I was talking about the first part. That's the main cause of low energy, low calories. So if you must have the smoothie, I would recommend you don't do it every day and, never, and only do it as a snack. It's not a great snack because low calories. Now, if you want to make it a good snack, put organic yogurt in there. Then it's calorie rich. So then it'll be a great snack. Amasaki is not enough calories to do it, so won't do it. <laughs> so it's all about calories. Yeah, right? all about calories. So it could be okay, like part of the meal, yeah. part of the meal. Oh, kale could be part. I usually recommend you those people. W nobody ate those goitrogens, goitrogenic foods, a lot in traditional cultures. Even in Japan, they never ate a lot of greens. This was a modern concept created by one prominent teacher, uh, which I think was one of his major mistakes because a lot of people started having thyroid issues after doing this many years. And the, the reason is two friends who were eating this way for 40 years just died of heart-related problems. Heart-related problems are related to the thyroid and low metabolism. That's what I talk about in one of my CDs. It's related to the thyroid and low metabolism. I believe there's a connection to what they were doing because a lot of people are doing these things for many, many years. Once a day, well, not at least. Some people once, some people five times a week. Depends on the person. Okay. How low the metabolism. It should be cooked, right? 
Correct. Correct. So we're talking about five times a week or three times a week. I wouldn't put them in a smoothie. I would have a nice green dish with olive oil dressing and just put them in the green dish because you know, it's a worst. It's a waste of food to put it in the smoothie. It's a waste of a good food, I think. That, that's only my personal. It's a waste of a good food to put in a smoothie. If you want to put in something in the smoothie, you know, put some fruit, you know, put some natural yogurt, you can put some coconut oil, put some things that are really more substantial. There's no benefit in it, having it that way, uh, unless you don't like greens. <laughs> like, then you're covering them up, right? That, that, that could be a reason. You know, if you don't like the greens, you know, you can get it in that way. So if you don't eat it other, otherwise, right. You, you like it in your smoothie. smoothie. I'm like getting you like it in your smoothie. Right. <laughs> right. You like it in there, huh? Well, you need it, you know, if you like it in there. So, yeah. It's, but be careful because you don't want to put like cups of it in there because it'll come, become really concentrated. So don't put more than a cup cooked in there of any green because then you get too much goitrogens. Wreck your thyroid. So blanching is not helping? It only helps a little. It takes a little bit of the goitrogens, put it in the water. Throw that water out. Because yeah, that's important. One more question yeah, and we'll finish it. Can you give an example of how <coughs> good balanced meal would be to <coughs> boost your metabolism? I it was like three or four days at a time, real high energy, and then three or four days at a time, yeah. real low. Right. Well, that's usually a stress reaction. Three days stress, four days low. So there's something that's causing the stress um, there. So, well, you know, a, a good meal to boost the metabolism, you know, might be like... A, you know, a fried noodle dish. Noodles are very concentrated. Uh, could be white noodles or whole grain noodles or soba noodles. Uh, you know, a piece of salmon or chickpeas, if vegetarian meal. Um, and some cooked vegetables that are sautéed in a good amount of coconut oil. You know, so that would boost your metabolism uh, if you ate enough of it. Uh, and especially if you made like a dried fruit compote, then metabolism really goes up because the sugar is more calories too concentrate energy. So dried fruit compote might be apricot, raisins, apples, pears. Uh, so that would boost your metabolism. If you really want to boost your metabolism, then put a little cre natural creme fraiche on it. That's like a kind of type of dairy product. That would even boost your metabolism more because more fats. So. Is ghee a saturated fat? Yeah, ghee is saturated. Okay, well thank you very much for coming tonight. Appreciate it. And uh, See you soon. <laughs>